Uh, I wanted to uh, thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to be here. I'm grateful for the organizers of this conference, Rod and his team, uh, especially uh, Carl and Katrina. Um, I'll get this started on the right one here. I'm also grateful to be sharing this uh, this panel with some great scholars, uh, scholars who I admire and I enjoy their work. Uh, Katrina. Can you do the login? I wanted to start just by giving you a little bit of uh, my interest in federalism, where it comes from. Uh, first, I consider myself a product of the American West, and so I'm going to talk in a moment about why I think the West has such a unique uh, and important uh, role in the development of federalism. Uh, and also, I wanted to share with you um, some of the research I've been doing. Uh, my background's in constitutional history, uh, and when I was at the beginning of my studies, uh, there was a Supreme Court case that came out uh, called Bond v. United States. Uh, and I wish we had time to get into the facts of Bond. They're fascinating. It would make for a great ABC drama. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll just tell you what the issue was in that case. The issue was uh, whether um, an individual citizen of the United States has standing, has the right to bring a claim under the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and so th that was the question. Or uh, the alternative theory would be that the only people able to bring claims under the Tenth Amendment were states, not people at all, states, qua states. Um, and so uh, in this case, the Supreme Court decided uh, nine to zero that an individual did have standing to bring a claim. And in that case, Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion, and he wrote what I like to call the ode to federalism, where he uh, listed all these wonderful things about federalism. He said, the allocation of powers between the national government and the states enhances freedom. Uh, federalism secures to the citizens the liberties that derive from the diffusion of sovereign power by denying any one government complete jurisdiction. Uh, federalism protects the liberty of the individual from arbitrary power. An individual has a direct interest in objecting to laws that upset that constitutional balance. Uh, and this is a great theory uh, of federalism, and it's very appealing because uh, the idea is that even if the rights that we mention in the Bill of Rights end up being watered down or misinterpreted, that there's still structural protection for uh, individual liberty. Uh, to give you uh, an example of how this might work, in, an, in a case in the early 2000s uh, called Kelo, the Supreme Court adopted an interpretation of a provision of the Fifth Amendment that was very deferential to government power and uh, not so solicitous of individual rights, uh, individual property rights. Um, it's the subject of a recent movie called Little Pink House. Uh, and as we all know, books are always better than the movies. So if you want to read the book, you can read The Grasping Hand by my uh, co-panelist here. Um, there was a reaction to Kelo at the state level. And I was practicing law at the time. And we had a takings case that ha happened to be in the Supreme Court at the time. And there was a reaction by state legislatures and state Supreme Courts against uh, what the Supreme Court had done. So in the end, there may have been a beefing up at, of property rights at the state level, at least in some states. That's why it's such an appealing theory. And this is what set me off in wanting to investigate uh, federalism more fully. Um, so there was one other thing that Justice Kennedy said in his uh, there's a little pink house, so suddenly we're here. A few of uh, the Tenth Amendment, I think Paul mentioned it's a mere truism. So uh, during Justice Kennedy's Ode to Federalism, he said one thing that intrigued me. He said the framers concluded that the allocation of powers between the national government and the state uh, the states enhances freedom. And I became curious about this statement because you'll notice this is a, a historical claim, right? Uh, this is something like an originalist claim about what federalism is. Uh, so I started off looking at this question 
I'm not going to talk about it today because others have, but it set me off on uh, a journey of researching how federalism evolved after the founding. Um, I believe that America's favorite pastime is not actually baseball, it's arguing the contours of federalism, where the boundary lies. So let's not think that the federalism was just set in 1787. Uh, the contest went on. They went on over whether we can have a national bank, whether Congress can ban slavery in the territories, whether uh, the New Deal was constitutional, and they go on today. Uh, and so my research area is in the, in the long 19th century and the questions that I'm interested in is how did others in that time frame view federalism? What did they think, uh, where did, would they put the proper boundaries uh, between uh, the national government and the states? Uh, and the main question is are we being faithful to our constitutional structure in law and policy? Uh, which raises the question of what is our constitutional structure and history has a lot to say about that. Um, so the evolution of American federalism includes, I think, the accumulation of power in the national government over time. Uh, often that sovereign power had been previously exercised by other sovereigns like states or tribes. Uh, and the story of how that sovereign power moves from one entity to another is often told in the United States on what I'd call a north-south axis, right? Uh, people talk about it in terms of slavery and civil war, uh, segregation, desegregation, civil rights. Um, these are important histories. Uh, the Civil War was, after all, the uh, bloodiest war in American history. And the long civil rights movement may not have achieved the level of success that it did without new theories of federal power. Yet these histories tend to leave out what I think are even more important historical events and processes that have shaped American federalism. And these events played out not between North and South, but uh, from East to West. The accumulation of power resulting from the north-south dichotomy, I think, Ray lather dormant after Reconstruction, but that's not to say that federal power was not growing. I think it was, and it was growing primarily because of what the United States was doing in the West. Um, and the story's more complicated when you tell uh, the history of federalism in this way. So on the north-south story, you have heroes. This is Otis Howard. He was a Civil War general. He was a big uh, figure in Reconstruction. Uh, he helped bring freedom to the slave, right? He's also the same general uh, who went and chased Chief Joseph around Idaho and Montana and forced his people onto reservations. So the story's more complicated, the history's more complicated, and I think the history's more enriching if we remember this aspect of history. I'm going to mention briefly a couple of ways in which the federal government altered federalism, the balance of power, as part of westward expansion. Uh, and the first has to do with Native American tribes. So when we think of federalism today, uh, we tend to think in binary terms, which we have a federal government and state governments, and that's it. At the founding, however, federalism in flux entailed <coughs> many entities and locations of power who vied uh, for allegiance from the people. There was, of course, the new national government. There was the state governments. Uh, there were county governments, which may have preceded their state governments. Uh, there were some ecclesiastical institutions which were established and which had certain kinds of uh, power and demanded allegiance from their people. And of course, there were Native American tribes. Uh, what did the Constitution have to say about tribes? Uh, not a lot, but it did mention them in a couple of places, uh, mostly in ways in which it recognized the continuing existence of tribal sovereignty. Uh, the Commerce Clause gives Congress power to regulate commerce uh, among the states, but with foreign nations and with uh, the Indian tribes. Later on, the 14th Amendment, which the, this is the first sentence of the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States. Uh, and they included this important caveat and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, which was a nod to continuing tribal sovereignty. So Indians born in the United States uh, were not citizens of the United States through the 14th Amendment. Uh, <coughs> this uh, recognition of continuing tribal sovereignty began to change uh, in the late uh, 1800s, in the 1870s. Uh, at that time, the national government 
began to take a stronger interest in regulating uh, Indian affairs, especially Indian on Indian crime, which had previously been left to tribes to regulate themselves. Uh, why was this? I think that the, f the historical factors are really messy and complicated, and at the risk of oversimplification, I'd say that in the wake of the Civil War, there was a growing idea that you could use the power of the federal government to get rid of local peculiar institutions and create a kind of American identity. Uh, so it's during this time that you begin to see these Indian boarding schools pop up whose specific goal was to take uh, Indians and Americanize them and Christianize them. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so there was a growing desire at the national level to prosecute Indians for crimes committed against other Indians. Uh, initially, there was not much appetite for that at the state level. Uh, states and territories were still content to let tribes regulate themselves. Uh, however, one species of Indian on Indian violence began to attract the attention of uh, Anglo-American settlers in states and territories in the 1870s. This is where my, in my research got really interesting. Uh, that violence was the killing of Indian witches by their tribes. So for the most part, uh, white settlers living in Nevada or California were happy to let Indians regulate themselves for an ordinary crime of burglary or murder, but when they started to see the killing of Indian witches, they took a greater interest um, and they started to publicize these accounts of Indian witch killings. Um, so here's one example. Um, and you can read hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles from the late 1800s uh, documenting Indian witch killings. These were sensationalized, unlike our news today, uh, because there was this purpose of wanting to now bring in uh, Anglo criminal justice into the tribes, and they succeeded in doing so. Uh, Congress finally passed legislati uh, le legislation in 1885 uh, giving the federal government power to regulate Indian non Indian crime. Where did Congress get this power? I don't know, but here's what the Supreme Court said. It said, in the United States, there can only be two sovereigns, national government or state government. So this marks a big switch, I think, from a federalism of multiple sovereigns, and we're now narrowing it down uh, to two, and we're placing all power in these two. Uh, what's the legacy of this history? Uh, American Indian history and law in the 20th century, I think, is even crazier than that of the 19th century. Um, here's what Justice Thomas says about federal Indian policy and how that policy seeps into law. He says uh, federal Indian policy is schizophrenic. Uh, and this plays up every year in the Supreme Court. It plays out. Uh, in state, especially here in the West, uh, there, federal Indian law, Indian law in general, is confusing. It's a patchwork of state law, tribal law, federal law, and the jurisdictional boundaries are not clear, and it's messy. And um, that's the heritage of, I think, failing to, sp to spell out specifically where the tribes have fit within the constitutional order. The second area that I wanted to talk about uh, where the federal government has exercised power in the West is in public lands. Um, so to back up uh, just a little bit, before the revolution there was this thing called crown lands in England and as the name suggests the king had basically unfettered power to manage uh, crown lands. He could lease them, he could hunt on them, he could sell them and that was particularly concerning to the colonists because Kings who could sell their land now have a lot of money sitting in the coffers. And what do kings with a lot of money and a lot of time tend to do? They tend to go off and start wars. And so for that reason, uh, when the founders needed to manage federal land, uh, they placed the power to do so not with the executive, uh, but with Congress. And interestingly, um, they placed the power not in Article I, where we find most of Congress's power, uh, but they placed it in Article IV, uh, which is a great article, and it talks about the relationship of the states with each other and with the federal government. Um, this is St. George Tucker. He was an early American legal thinker who expressed this concern about having uh, too much money and power in the hands of the executive, uh, resulting from the sale of land. Uh, despite Tucker's uh, concerns, 
the policy of the United States from the founding through much of the 1800s was uh, to dispose of land for the most part. Uh, so when a territory became a state, uh, it would grant that state some trust lands and then the federal government would take on the role of selling off lands within the state. So you may have heard that phrase, land office business, which developed in the 1800s meant to con 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 continuing uh, uh, and busy business. Uh, so you've no doubt seen, there's the property clause, that's Article 4. You've no doubt seen maps like this, or this one in particular, which demonstrates the ownership of land uh, by the federal government in all the states, and you can see the disparity in the West. You may not be familiar with this picture, um, and I've, I sometimes hesitate to show it because uh, I don't think it, the resolution was exactly right, but what it shows are state trust lands. So these are lands that the federal government granted to the states when they became states. Um, and the blue dots are state trust lands that have uh, restrictions placed on them for use by the federal government. So unlike eastern states, even these state lands uh, have restricted use. You can notice the one state in the west that didn't have any restrictions placed on its use, Nevada, and it ended up selling off most of its state trust land. Um, there is a common belief, I think, that the federal government does a better job man managing uh, public lands than states would do. I just want to finish with a cautionary tale about that. Uh, when the Congress wanted to create national parks, or should be large recreation parks for the first time, its initial instinct was not to create a national park, but to take that land and give it to a state. So Yosemite was created initi initially as a state park. John Muir hated California's management of Yosemite, and he fought a decades-long battle to get the land transferred from California to the national government. His chief antagonist during this um, <coughs> battle was a guy named John Irish, who was part of the committee in California that managed uh, Yosemite and they fought back and forth and they hated each other and it's fun to read what they wrote about each other. Um, finally, John Muir won and he sent out his celebratory telegrams to all of his friends. We won, I took Teddy Roosevelt on a tour and now we got the land in federal hands. Isn't it wonderful? What was the first thing that the federal government did with Yosemite? They built a huge reservoir right in the middle of it and John Muir hated this, right? He felt this was a big betrayal of what he had been working for I was curious to know what John Irish thought of the reservoir. <laughs> so I went back and did a little research. And John Irish hated the reservoir too. He was the California manager. Um, so it's one of those lessons of be careful what you wish for uh, John Muir and be careful if you think that the federal government does the best job in managing lands, whether it be fires or accidentally dumping chemicals into rivers. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, the history is interesting in and of itself. I think it has great implications for to debate, to debates today in political circles and legal argument. And uh, I have some thoughts on where federalism might be going, but I think there's an opportunity to talk about that later. So I'll conclude here to make sure Pre Professor Somin has some time here. Thank you.